I'm Caroline Framke. And I'm Daniel D'Addario. And we are Variety's chief TV critics, and we are here to break down the best shows of the decade. We spent a long time going through our favorites, some of the biggest shows that have aired in TV history, and we came up with this list of 10. We did have a list of 25, which you can read in full on Variety.com, and you should. So our number 10 show of the decade is... RuPaul's Drag Race. So starting with maybe a curveball for some of you, but if you're a fan of Drag Race, maybe you're not surprised by this pick because I don't think that any show on our full list, including Game of Thrones, has had as big a pop culture impact as Drag Race. RuPaul has always made it his mission to bring drag more into the mainstream, even though he insists that drag will never be fully mainstream, but Drag Race has done a pretty good job of it so far. I would say that this show, which started pretty self-referential, poking fun at a lot of reality shows, has now become a reality show it was kind of making fun of in the first place, even though it still has its sense of humor. For our number nine show, we are staying in the reality format with Comedy Central's Nathan For You. This is a show that was underheralded, I would say. I have not seen it on a ton of decade lists. However, it's both very funny and it has a ton to say about the decade we just lived through. The comedian Nathan Fielder in the world of the show is a business school grad going to help gig economy workers and struggling small business owners revamp their businesses and compete with the likes of Amazon. He and his isolation and his nervousness are the butt of the joke. A lot's made of how awkward the show is, but I think he is a real comic genius who always knows how to put the eye exactly back on himself rather than on these people. He really is ultimately just trying to help. Our number eight show is another one that you picked, and uh, that is Better Call Saul. So Breaking Bad is not on our list, yeah. but Better Call Saul is. Better Call Saul is another one of those shows that's all about the decade we just lived through. It's all about a hopeful young man slowly seeing his morals kind of leech away through a series of small compromises and becoming complicit with some really bad things. There are great performances across the board, and it is not just an attempt to keep the Breaking Bad phenomenon going like Joey was for Friends. It actually <laughs> is its own very special thing. And our number seven show is another legal drama. This one is a favorite of yours and the only network drama in our top 10. That's right, that would be The Good Wife, which started on CBS in 2009 and is such a 2010 show in its own way. This one starring Juliana Margulies ostensibly started as being about The Good Wife, who had to stand by her cheating husband who happened to be a very big Chicago politician. This show was really smart about its legal cases and brought in a lot of real world stories and was really good on the intersection of politics and power and race and just a lot of different issues that I think are always relevant relevant and ever more relevant, and The Good Wife was ahead of it on a lot of stuff. Our number six show is a bit newer, and that is Atlanta. Started in 2016, and it is a cable series that, for awards purposes, is slotted as a comedy. It really sits at the intersection of genre. It's a show that really does a good job of combining ground-level authentic storytelling about this really complex moment in American race relations and what it's like being a young black person in America today with a surreality and a kind of willingness to experiment and be outright strange that I think is kind of genuinely unlike everything else on TV. It really rarely feels like it's trying too hard. It almost always sticks the landing of what it's trying to do and what it's trying to say. It also has one of our favorite performances of the decade in Brian Tyree Henry who plays Paperboy, Donald Glover's best friend on the show. He's incredible and has gone on to show exactly why he should be on anyone's best performances list in movies and TV since. Yeah. Number five is another drama comedy hybrid, Fleabag, which aired in the US on Amazon Prime Video. Yeah, see, I'm fine with Fleabag being done because Fleabag ended perfectly, which is so hard to do. We only have two seasons of this show. This is from Phoebe Waller-Bridge. The first season was based on her one-woman show. This is a show that's always been completely itself. It has such a strong voice. It's so well-directed. And that second season just really kind of it didn't come out of nowhere, but it did surprise me and a lot of other people. It obviously translated bigger than the first season ever did because it swept the Emmys in a pretty unbelievable way. And now Phoebe Waller-Bridge, I will not be surprised if she goes on to be an even bigger force in television. Our number four show, The Americans. Yes, The Americans, which ran for six seasons, is just such a technically perfect yes. show. Yes. If anything, the reason why it's only number four on our top four, which is a very high position still, is that I think it could be at moments a bit bloodless, but 
overall, the dual performance of Russell and Reese, who are two of the great performers of the decade and on our performers list, kind of carried the day. They play married spies. Their cover is their marriage. They were sent over from the Soviet Union into Reagan's America of the 80s. This show takes its cues from real life and America won the Cold War, at least we thought at the time. And, and so it's the story of their kind of trying to fight a losing battle and oddly falling more in love throughout. And our number three show, which incidentally is my number one show, is HBO's Enlightened, starring Laura Dern as a woman who goes away to inpatient behavioral therapy treatment and comes back a changed woman ready to change the world. The only problem is the world isn't ready to be changed. And it is a social comedy of sorts. She's kind of a believer in any self-help cause that comes her way, and that certainly feels true to our time too. But it's also just such a human show. It has a really big beating heart, unlike a lot of stuff on TV at its moment. So I thought it was really special. Incidentally, Laura Dern has had an incredible decade of TV between this and Big Little Lies and Twin Peaks. So it would be wrong not to have her on the list in some way. And we were not in danger of it because this is your number one show of the decade. Yes, and it happily lands at number three. Number two is your number one of the decade. Our number two show of the decade is BoJack Horseman. This is a Netflix dramedy. I think it's safe to say. This has been around since 2014, so it's one of the earliest Netflix originals. And, and this is a show that's completely unique unto itself from Raphael Bob Waxberg. It's an animated show about a depressed horse. It's very stark and unsparing in terms of who it targets, and that means always the most powerful people. It always took big risks with its format, which is pretty laudable, especially in the animated sphere. It just really went for it. It had all these beautiful one-off episodes that really played around with the animation in a way that only an animated show could do. BoJack really encapsulates a lot of 2010's innovation in terms of television and also as a Netflix series. This is the kind of show that could not have happened before this decade. But there can only be one number one show of the decade and after a lot of discussion and swapping around and compromise, we came to our number one show of the decade and that is The Leftovers from HBO. And I knew that if I told you what happened, that you would never believe me. I believe you. A show about grief and the process of grieving that week to week was also the most exciting, exhilarating, strangely funny, inventive, strange show that could have existed in this 10 year span. It turned a lot of people off with this kind of dirge-like mournful tone, really deep character work by Carrie Coon, especially playing a woman whose entire nuclear family disappeared in a global cataclysm that's taken away 2% of the world's population. A really smart show about the characters and the people rather than their situation. I think it's a really nice note to end on with Lindelof who began the decade with the kind of final seasons of Lost, kind of reigned over prestige cable at its midpoint with this critical favorite and ends it with his own inventive spin on the superhero drama with Watchmen. So I feel like he's a person who kind of represents all the different ways in which culture played out on television over the last decade. So my hope is that when we meet back here in 10 years, we will have 10 more shows that do as interesting work in combining and reforming in ways we haven't even thought of yet. Certainly we wouldn't have seen The Leftovers coming uh, this time 10 years ago. So here's to 10 more years of good TV.